I'm a 37-year-old office worker, and my husband, Robert, who is eight years older, and I have been married for 11 years now. Due to some reasons, I'm living with my mom. Let me explain how I ended up in this situation. Four years ago, Robert and I built a house. At that time, Robert had just changed jobs, and we didn't have much money saved or a big income. Robert used to work for a big company, but he faced constant hidden bullying from his boss. This caused him sleep problems, and eventually, he couldn't go to work anymore. He saw a psychiatrist, took a break for about three months, but when he didn't get better, he quit his job. After that, we got by on just my salary. Robert didn't work for three months, but slowly started to feel better. He began eating and sleeping well again, and his psychiatrist was pleased with his quick recovery. My cheerful, loving Robert was back. He then started looking for a new job. His experience at the big company helped, but finding a job was hard because he left his last job due to mental health issues. During this time, we found a small company that needed him. The salary was about a third of what he used to make, but he was happy to be working again. He said it was much better than being without a job, which made me happy. This job was also in the field he wanted to work in, we wanted to have children, but it was clear that life would be tough if I stopped working, so I continued working. I also loved my job, and we decided not to have children at that time since it was just the three of us. Our life was peaceful until my mother, Sarah, was paralyzed in a car accident and needed a wheelchair to get around. My dad had passed away when I was in middle school and Sarah had been living alone since then. Our family home was old and not suitable for a wheelchair, with many steps. Robert then said, I'm worried. Let's live together. Sarah, and I were surprised, but I appreciated Robert's unexpected kindness. Since Robert had just changed jobs, we were unsure about the future, but we decided to apply for a mortgage. As we expected, it was tough to get a loan because Robert hadn't been at his job for long. However, we were determined and didn't give up. After trying with several mortgage companies, we finally found one that worked with us and approved our loan. We bought our dream home, which I had always imagined filled with the smell of wood, thick wooden beams on the ceiling, custom storage spaces, a kitchen tailored for my height, and spacious cypress flooring. Importantly, it was a single-story, barrier-free house, perfect for living comfortably in a wheelchair. We were excited as the house was being built and visited the construction site every day. When our carefully designed home was finished, had a large yard where my mom, who now seldom went outside, could enjoy sunbathing. However, there was a catch with the land. It was given to us by Robert's grandfather, who adored Robert. Robert's family wasn't wealthy, but when his grandfather was diagnosed with cancer, he started to distribute his assets, giving us the largest plot of land. It felt like winning the lottery, but the land was just a 10-minute walk from Robert's family home. When we told them my mother would be moving in with us, Robert's sister, Emily, laughed and said, Why is your mother moving in too? How shameless is your family? Robert's mother, Maria, told me, Marrying someone different like you would bring trouble. She also harshly said it was terrible for her son to have to care for an old person and called me a curse. Even then, Robert stood up for my mother and me. He said the land was a gift from his grandfather and no one should complain. Robert's mother and sister are really mean. It's amazing that Robert, who is so kind, comes from that family. He's like a beautiful flower that grew out of mud. Robert always says his family shows him how not to be. Robert thinks his grandfather gave us the land because he wanted us to take care of his mother in her old age. He also gave other properties away. Robert's sister got a parking lot that's a 10-minute walk from their home. It's smaller than our land but makes good money from parking fees. Honestly, I would have preferred that, but a gift is still a gift, and we are thankful. Thanks to my grandfather-in-law, we could build our house without paying for the land and used it to help get a loan. When the house was finished, we invited Robert's mother and sister's family over. The builders told us they had visited the house several times without asking us. 
They showed up late without apologizing and said, this is kind of like grandpa's house, so it's like our house too. Robert's sister came in with muddy shoes and said, the house smells nice and doesn't need air fresheners. She and her husband walked around with muddy shoes, ignoring the slippers we offered. When I suggested they use slippers, she laughed and said, it's too much trouble and we could just clean the floor. The visit was uncomfortable from the start and they didn't bring anything with them. When they saw my mother's room, which is spacious and sunny, Robert's mother said, I would like that room. My mother's room is like a duplex with its own kitchen, almost a second living space. I want to live here, said my mother-in-law during the third point of her conversation. She then told my mother, you were lucky to have that accident, weren't you? Thanks to being paralyzed, you moved from that old shack to this nice house. Isn't that a lucky turn of events? My mother said nothing but looked very sad. I was really angry inside, but before I could say anything, Robert spoke up. What did you just say? There are things you should and shouldn't say. It makes me question your humanity. I can't even believe you're part of my family. You're the worst. Apologize now, Robert demanded firmly. Whether they were amused or not, my mother and sister-in-law glared at me. Then my sister-in-law angrily asked Robert, What's this all about? It's a total turn-off. It's not cool to invite people over and then be rude to them just because you built a house. You think you can act superior. The mother-in-law chimed in. My son messed up by marrying you. You're a jinx. Robert didn't stay silent. Enough is enough. This mess started because of your rude comments. You said the accident was a good thing and called my wife a jinx. I will not forgive that. The mother and sister-in-law looked frustrated by Robert's strong response. Then my mother, who had been watching everything, said with regret, It's okay. I am here because of the accident, and it's true I moved from a rundown house to this beautiful one. Your son has always been kind to me. My mother apologized to Robert. Thank you, perhaps feeling guilty, the mother and sister-in-law left, giving me a nasty look. My mother then apologized to Robert. I'm sorry if I upset your mother and sister. I'm sorry for ruining the mood at our housewarming party. Robert responded, No, I should be the one apologizing. It's embarrassing how they lack decency. I'm really sorry, but I am happy to be living with you. Please understand that. With that, my mother started to tear up. Since we live near Robert's parents' house, the neighbors all know us well. They've known Robert since he was a child and are very kind to us. Four months have passed since that day. We were finally settling into our new home, and my mother started to smile more when I received an unexpected call from home while I was at work. We rarely get calls from home, so it surprised me. My bad feeling was right. My mom, sounding very upset, called to tell me something awful. Robert had collapsed at work. I was shocked and spoke to my right away, then rushed to the hospital on the way. I try to stay calm by imagining that Robert would be okay, joking around like always, but when I arrived it was a shock to see him with so many tubes attached to him. We had planned to go to a movie that weekend. The doctor told me Robert was in critical condition and might not wake up. I felt like I was in a movie. I couldn't even cry. Despite my prayers, Robert passed away at the hospital. My shock continued as my mother and sister-in-law arrived when they heard Robert had died. My sister-in-law accused me harshly, asking if I had poisoned him or if I was after his life insurance. My mother-in-law also blamed me, saying bad things always happen around me and called me a jinx. I was too sad to respond. Then my own mother arrived in a caregiver's taxi, crying over Robert's death, which finally made me cry too. My mother-in-law rudely told us to stop the fake crying. She said Robert had changed because of me and that she didn't want to see us ever again. Then she left the hospital. A funeral director came to organize Robert's funeral and we went to the funeral home. Robert had died from a brain hemorrhage, which was hard to believe since he was fine that morning. When I told my mother-in-law the funeral plans, she harshly said she wouldn't come because Robert always sided with my mother and me. She said her daughter wouldn't come either. Many of Robert's co-workers and friends came to the viewing, 
but neither my mother-in-law nor my sister-in-law and her husband were there. Many attended the funeral, and it was clear that Robert was deeply loved. Many people cried for him. It was hard, but maybe this is just the kind of people his family were. I was happy to spend the whole day with those who truly missed my husband. After Robert's death, I got an email from my mother-in-law, but it was inappropriate, so, so it didn't reply. She was asking about the life insurance money and kept emailing because I didn't respond. Eventually, she claimed she had a right to it. I chose to ignore it because I wasn't ready to deal with that. When we got home, I noticed a light on inside, which was odd. My mother Sarah was confused and thought we had turned off all the lights. I figured maybe I forgot because I was so upset. I told her it was understandable, given the situation, and I unlocked the door. When we entered, we could hear the TV, which was very strange. Inside, we found my sister-in-law and her husband sitting there. I was so shocked I couldn't even speak up. The living room was full of unfamiliar furniture and boxes. We had no idea what was happening. My sister-in-law said, why did you just barge in here? Well, it's your first time, so I'll let it slide. We're taking this house. We sold your stuff, so leave. My mother and I were completely shocked. I asked where our furniture and belongings had gone, and she casually said, a resale company came and took everything, claiming we had good furniture, and they got a good price for it. They bought new furniture with that money, saying, who wants furniture that a dead person used? It's bad luck. She added that she cared about such things and our stuff was packed in boxes. She even remarked that we must be minimalists or just poor because we had so few things. The furniture was carefully chosen by my husband and me. I couldn't forgive them for this. My mom was furious too, her face turning beet red, but she was too shocked to respond. I immediately called the resale company. After explaining the situation, they agreed to treat the items as stolen and return them. Now that my husband is gone, dealing with this was the last thing I needed. I don't want anything to do with this family, but I do want to stay in the house that's full of memories of him. While I was wrestling with these feelings, my mother quietly said to me, what do you think Robert would say if he were here now? He might say we should leave. I'm sure he would. Robert often mentioned, it's good to spend time with people who understand you, but there are some people who will never understand, no matter how much you try. It's a waste of time dealing with those people. He was actually talking about his own mother and sister. I realized that if we stayed, his family would keep interfering, acting on impulse. I signed a lease for an accessible apartment. My mom was surprised by how quickly I made that decision. I asked the resale company to hold on to the furniture for a few days, and it was moved to our new apartment three days later. In exchange for moving out, I made my mother-in-law and sister-in-law promise to cut ties with us, so a new life began for just my mother and me in the apartment. It turns out Robert had many life insurance policies, almost obsessively, so he used to joke, always with a smile, when I die, you guys will be rich. True to his word, he left enough money for my mother and me to be comfortable for the rest of our lives. Since he couldn't secure a mortgage when we bought the house, I being employed at a major corporation, bought the house in my name. I made sure that even if something happened to Robert first, I wasn't going to keep paying a mortgage for a house I wouldn't live in. According to our agreement, the house would be auctioned off if the mortgage wasn't paid for four months. Time flew by, and four months passed quickly. Then I started receiving a lot of calls from my sister-in-law Emily and my mother-in-law Maria. My call history was filled with their names, and it was getting scary, like something out of a horror movie. They were incredibly persistent, so I finally answered the phone. They were furious because the house was being sold. Apparently, when they tried to return to the house, they found out they couldn't get in because of a seizure notice. Emily and her husband had moved out of their apartment since Robert passed away, and Emily had also quit her job. I suggested they move back into their parents' house since they were panicking about suddenly being homeless. Surprisingly, Maria had gotten so caught up in gambling that she couldn't keep up and had sold her own house. 
It turns out they had been living together for the past five months. I also heard that they sold their main source of income, a parking lot in front of the train station, a long time ago. Now Maria and Emily's family are completely homeless. When Maria said, I'm sorry for everything. Let's get along. Can you lend me some money, please? I replied, I think it's best if you stay away since I'm a jinx. We're strangers now that we've severed ties. Maria was quiet after mumbling weakly. In my mind, I was thinking, who's the real bad luck charm here? Then when I said I wouldn't lend them a single cent, Emily, who had been listening next to Maria, shouted, you devil. Bring us the money right now. I'm a devil and bad luck, so I'm going to hang up now. I replied and ended the call. In reality, I involved a lawyer for the past five months to push for the auction of the house. I thought it was an unusual case, but apparently, it's not that uncommon. The house was sold without any major issues. Giving our family a moment of peace, we plan to find a new home with the money Robert left us since it's just my mother and me. We don't need a big house. We'd rather prioritize security as two women living together. So I chose a condominium with minimal noise disturbance. I remember something my husband always said when we built our home. People can get energy from the sun, so let's create a place where the mother-in-law can enjoy her hobby of reading in the garden without feeling self-conscious. With those words, he had made a spacious courtyard for her, so I looked for a condo with a large balcony where she could enjoy her coffee and read. It's smaller than our previous home, but the room is spacious enough to house the furniture my husband probably chose. The piece of land that was gifted to us by Robert's grandfather was expansive, and the house sold for more than expected. With that money, we're moving forward. I recently bought a luxurious condominium with exceptional security features, a choice I'm sure would have comforted my always cautious husband, Robert. The peace of mind that comes from living in such a secure place is invaluable, especially after the tumultuous experiences with my in-laws. Life has taken a dramatic turn since Robert passed away. Amidst my grief, I've been dealing with the fallout from his family's actions, which frankly, has been draining. Following the auction of the house, Robert's mother, Maria, and his sister found themselves without a place to live. Despite their desperate attempts, including trying to borrow money from neighbors, they couldn't secure any financial assistance and ended up in public housing. Living in public housing, they continued their old habits, causing disturbances that have started to concern the community. For instance, they recently had a barbecue on their small balcony, an act that left many locals in disbelief given the limited space and safety concerns. Such thoughtlessness seems typical of them and reflects the disregard they've always shown for others' comfort. Moreover, their financial difficulties appear to have led to frequent loud arguments that disrupt the Nike peace, an auditory testament to their ongoing strife. My sister-in-law's husband has since left, leaving just her and Maria to fend for themselves. Their situation is a stark contrast to the quiet, stable life I now lead with my mother. We're both two-person households, but while my home is a sanctuary, theirs is a source of constant conflict and unease. It's become so disruptive that neighbors are banding together, hoping to evict them to restore some semblance of peace. It's a harsh reminder that no matter where you go, being a nuisance can make you unwelcome. Reflecting on these events, I realize how the phrase, what goes around comes around, rings true. My goal is to live quietly and peacefully, distanced from the embarrassing turmoil associated with my former family. I believe Robert watches over us, perhaps with mixed feelings about the chaos his family continues to perpetuate, in contrast to the tranquility he loved during his life. As I move forward, my focus is on living a life that causes no trouble to others. I want to honor Robert's memory, not just through words but through actions. He always advocated for a life well lived, surrounded by people who bring joy and understanding. Despite the unfortunate family dynamics he left behind, I'm committed to building a life filled with positivity and peace. The decision to buy this condominium wasn't just about finding a new home. It was about creating a haven where my mother and I could feel safe and secure. The quiet, the order, 
and the absence of drama allow us to enjoy each other's company and focus on the things that truly matter. It's smaller than our previous house, but every corner of this new space is cherished, every moment of silence savored. I've learned a lot about resilience and moving forward. The memories of Robert, filled with love and laughter, inspire me every day. They remind me of the importance of living authentically and compassionately, ensuring that his spirit of kindness is carried forward. Living well is perhaps the best tribute I can offer to a man who gave so much and asked for so little in return. In this new chapter, amidst the serenity of our chosen sanctuary, I am determined to live not just for myself but in a way that would make Robert proud.